Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, thanks a lot for the intro. Thanks to Justin for inviting me out here. Um, absolute pleasure and honor to be here. Um, this is my passion and research. I love all things recovery, all things float. Um, thanks to Jocelyn for, for getting everything arranged to, to help me get out here as well. Uh, what I wanted to do today is uh, give you an introduction for what we're doing at the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute and why flotation therapy is really at the, the forefront of everything we believe in and everything that we're doing. Uh, my path to, to getting to this place has, has been a little strange. Um, I think everybody has a, probably a strange story how they got where they are. Um, but I'm just really lucky to what I do every day. I, I love what I do, and I'm very passionate about it. Um, and I got very lucky to get here. And I'm an, I'm an engineer by training, so absolutely not a real doctor whatsoever. Um, so, so take that for what it's worth. Uh, I just got lucky that I was uh, doing some DOD research in, in grad school and kind of got into making devices and, and making things where we could measure some physiology and doing very nerdy things in the lab, not anywhere close to a human being, just trying to to make some things. And what happened about five years ago, <clears throat> give or take, is this explosion of wearable technologies happened that I think probably everybody in this room is tracking some part of their physiology every day, whether it's steps or sleep or heart rate variability, whatever it is. Um, now it's pretty commonplace for us to measure and understand ourselves. So that's really changed the dynamic of a lot of what we do. And, and seeing that happen, you know, we took a, a, a pretty nice uh, pivot in our research of still developing next generation stuff and still interested in, in pretty, you know, hard, hard answers to hard questions. Uh, but we really need to understand what can we measure and what does it actually mean. Um, and so that's when I made my, my really pivot into this of, of working with human beings. So, I, you know, I came at it of like the more data is better, the more data is better. I just want data, data, data. But once you start working with real humans, what's important? What do we need to measure? Why does this make a difference? And once we have that data, I can give you the shiniest sensor in the world. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of one that, that I love. We have this now. I can give this beautiful dashboard. I'll give you pictures of this. This is great. We can do all of this. But if I have those two things and I'm not going to tell you what to do to get yourself better and get yourself more recovered and get you, yourself to perform better and recover from concussion and PTSD, we can throw all that other stuff away. It doesn't, doesn't mean anything. So that's really our driving factor at the, at the Rockefeller. And um, less than two years ago, I got the, the chance to move to, to West Virginia and, and the Institute and build up this, this brand, new, brand new facility. Um, and so I got 25,000 square feet to build out kind of my dream human performance lab. And so I, I kind of cut it into two sections. I love sports science and tactical performance science, but I love recovery science. So we have a, a pretty hardcore, legit recovery science lab that we could build from scratch. Um, and that, that's really our mission in this space. And so we have a lot of cap really nice capabilities at the Rockefeller. Um, so we're doing lots of things, you know, some of the things that we see here in virtual reality. Um, what I lead is a human performance research side. We do a lot in sleep, um, brain computer interfaces and data analytics. So we have all those capabilities, but what I want to talk about is our purpose. One of the things that really drew me to the Rockefeller uh, was it's all purpose driven. So anything that we're doing has to have a positive effect on the people that we are trying to help. And we have, we have broad objectives. We want to help everybody, right? Um, so we do have distinct projects to, to get into how we're going to do that. Um, I do want to point out that, that TEDx link up there. Um, so that's uh, Dr. Ali Rezai, um, if any of you are familiar with him. He's the reason I'm at West Virginia, a world-class brain surgeon. Um, please, please watch that if you have a chance. He's doing some absolutely groundbreaking research in, in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and um, you're going to see some things in there that'll blow your mind. He'll he'll buzz past it in 20 seconds. You're like, are, are you serious? You just did that? Um, he's got some amazing things going on right now for uh, to non-invasively open up the blood-brain barrier for Alzheimer's treatment um, and reversibly close it 24 hours later. So uh, please, yeah, take take some time to see that. It's it's uh, pretty amazing. So as we try to get to, right, we want to help everybody. That's a very broad goal. Um, how do we start dialing into how we're really going to do that? And our what is we want to transform health, right? So we have our chronological age, right? So that's our linear age. So I'm 42 chronologically. What we can do is modulate our biological age. So what is your age based on your health and wellness and disease state? I'm happy to inform you that I'm 31 years old biologically based on my telomeres. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I thought it was going to be the reverse when I tested. I was going to do all sorts of really crazy stuff to get it down. It came back good. I was like, well, all right. Um, but maybe I credit that to floating. I'm a regular floater. Um, I'm a believer, so uh, we'll say that that's reduced my age by a decade. Um, but I think through, through telomere technology and different things that we can do, what are the things that we can do in our lives with sleep, exercise, nutrition, stress reduction, all the things we're talking about here 
to take care of ourselves and lower our biological age. I think we, we ignore ourselves a lot of times. I think this is a unique room to where we probably are ones that don't ignore ourselves because we all believe we're all here with the same purpose of float therapy and stress reduction. So I'd imagine we've all tried it and, and we're big believers in it. But how do we translate that to the masses? What I'm excited about is all the things in the lobby, right? So that's our enable, enabler. So you, any major city, you can go find a float center. Um, now it's, you know, as, as mentioned before, professional teams are starting to get these in their facilities. You can see this outgrowth of companies that are made, making great technologies that we can buy and utilize. But as Justin mentioned earlier, we've got to drive the research, we've got to drive the science, but we've got the right people in the room to do that, right? So how do we do this? As I mentioned before, now that we can actually measure our physiology through wearable sensors, things that we can buy commercially, we don't need super high tech, super expensive stuff that you'd have in a physiology lab. We can uh, very accurately measure these things in ourselves. What we need to do is we need to know what we need to measure and we need to measure it well. We need to measure it accurately. We need to trust that data. Once we have that data, we need to understand what that data really means. Once we have all of that, what do we do with it and how do I make you better? So how do I enable everybody in this room to run many clinical studies on ourselves to understand this is going on in my physiology, this is a problem, how do I do something differently in my life and see that that actually makes a difference and makes me better? Um, so good news is, is we're, we're coming a long way in that um, to where that's, that's commercially available and now we can do, do a lot of that. So how we approach it at, at the Research Institute, and, and again, we want to drive this research forward. We want to get everything out there. I love Justin's idea of the moonshot, and um, Justin, if you're out there, I want in on that. Um, and this is how we're approaching it. And so again, we want to affect a lot of communities. So day to day, I work a lot in the high performance side. So um, you know, my, my real passion is, is in military in helping our warfighters, helping our special operators. Um, I got incredibly lucky. Uh, again, about five years ago, my mentor, Mark Stevenson, I know a few in the room know, um, he founded Tactical Strength and Conditioning with NSCA. He worked with very high-level special operators, and that's how I got to meet him. Now he's a director of player performance with the Detroit Lions. Um, if he didn't have a game tomorrow, he, I'm sure he'd be here. Um, <clears throat> and that's where I really got introduced to all of this, of why are we doing this, and how do we take care of these guys? And just hearing them, they're putting their lives on the line every single day, um, and they're doing it for us. And they're just getting broken and more broken along the way, and they're, they're in the fight. And it's, so as soon as they get out, right, they're broken, and, and we need to fix them, and we need to take, take care, better care of them. So how do we do that when they're in the fight? How do we accelerate the recovery? How do we get them to repair their brains? Like they're going through many concussive blasts every single day. The stress that they see is unreal, nothing any of us can fathom. So there's things that we can do with float therapy and meditation and light therapy, all sorts of great things, but we've got to drive the research so it, it now becomes commonplace for them. So that's how we're studying them. So the, the challenge for us is it's not easy to study military, uh, especially special operators. There's absolutely no control, right? That's they, what they do is life or death. They can get deployed. I can lose track of them. I don't have control over everything that's going on. So from a scientific perspective, it's, it's hard to model. We found a number of years ago, um, back when I was in Ohio, I partnered with Ohio State University. The Ohio State Buckeyes are gonna thrash Nebraska tonight. Um, so uh, I started the sports science program there. Um, and I'm happy to say, but talking to Greg Sudbury, they've got I don't know, eight or 10 float tanks up there now. We put the very first one in there in a place that it absolutely didn't belong, but we crammed it in, in a place. Uh, made a lot of people mad, but the athletes absolutely loved it. Um, but what we found is that we can study athletes and we can get some of these answers for high performers because I know, I know what they're doing every day. Um, so they're physically stressing themselves quite a bit. They do have emotional stress. I mean, they're, they're college athletes, so they have lots of demands on, on their time. But I can model that. I know their performance during games. I know all their training loads, a lot of different things. So now I can start thinking about doing a controlled study and understanding how these, how these things are actually affecting them. Now I get to the patient side, on the clinical side. And Justin had some beautiful examples, um, and Dr. Walker as well, um, earlier this morning. Um, right, so we can have people that span all, like a military operator can span all of these. They can be an athlete, they can be a patient when they have PTSD, TBI, things like that that we need to help them with, chronic pain. All of these things are, you know, primed and ready, and a lot of them already been proven out in the flow, but we need to update the research, we need to get bigger ends, we need to get this, you know, kind of more into the, the hands of MDs that say like, yeah, no kidding, instead of giving you this prescription, go do this. Um, and our chronic pain clinic at WVU is, is pretty amazing because they're doing psychotherapy, acupuncture, we're starting to float, we're starting to do light therapy. So think about alternative strategies to just handing out more and more pain painkiller prescriptions. And so we think more specifically about the, the warfighter demands, um, there's all sorts of things that we need to do. We need to physically train them, 
really hard. They have massive cognitive demands. Um, all the things that they have to do to actually perform in the field. We've got all sorts of data coming in, but the bottom right is, is really what we can do to positively affect all those things, right? They know how to lift weights. They know how to train tactively. They're, they're really good at this, but what we still don't know how to do is recover them day to day because they're gonna train just as hard, if not harder tomorrow. They're gonna go on a mission in two days. These are, um, we, we're never gonna change that, right? They're always gonna train hard. So how do I get their body, how do I hack their body into a place that they can recover from these things even better? So when they get done serving and they retire out, they are healthy and they are able and they are active. Um, so that's really a driving force in what we're doing. So let's kind of wrap our heads around what kind of data we can, we can use to map all of this and, and why things like float are so, so important to all this data. So we can take an entire day in the life of an athlete or an operator and we can actually start quantifying all of these different things. So we can understand these demands and understand what we need to do to help them. So you wake up in the morning with a stress response based on all that training load that you've done, all of the stress, all of your sleep. We've got sleep trackers. First thing in the morning, we do a resting heart rate variability measurement. We can get subjective data. When you're out training, I can get heart rate data, rate of perceived exertion, all these really great data sources. And then what we're really trying to, to modulate, and this is, you know, uh, Mark Stevenson and I talked this over and over, so he, he calls this managing the white space, that recover section. So they're going to train their faces off every single day, right? That, that mentality is I'm going to train. We've got to change the mentality to actually make recovery part of their day. And it's part of something that you do, but we need to know how to do it, know how to do it well. And it's not always something where the more is better. We need to be very prescriptive about the, the approach that we take. But with all the wearables and all of our data, we can now start tracking these. And why do we want to do this, especially for, for high performance and, and even for executives or us in the room, like burnout's a real thing. Uh, maybe overtraining isn't an issue for, certainly not for myself. Um, so training is, is going to be good for me. But all these things, when you're basically taking out more cash and you're putting into your bank account, you're not recovering from stress. And stress is stress. So it doesn't have to be physical stress. It can be all your emotional demands. And if you're not allowing your brain to recover from all those things, then you're going to have these negative consequences and, and ultimately get to, to some bad things that can happen. Um, and so we have a lot of different ways to measure this physiology now, right? And so thinking about an athlete, on the left-hand side are all of the things physiologically in the body that we can possibly measure. But what's exciting about right now in the last couple of years, we have commercial devices where we can really measure all these things. I do want to point out Will, um, who's on, on the Carolina Panthers, He's probably the most dialed in athlete I've ever met. Um, he's, he was a heavy meditator. He absolutely loved float. We got a float tank in there towards the end of last season, um, crammed it in a place that it, it wasn't designed to be in, but we got it in there for him. Um, but he had that right mentality of, of taking care of himself, taking care of his, his, uh, his brain to really perform at a high level, and, and he did an amazing job at it. So I talked about a magical sensor, right? So I have no, I probably should have said this up front, I have no financial disclosures to anybody. I just want the best, I'm an academic, I want the best technology that's gonna work for the people that I work with. What's really exciting is we've got technologies like Aura, and I know a few in the room, I've seen them, um, I always look at what everybody's wearing, um, have these now. And what we're finding, we do um, what we call gold standard validation studies in our lab, because it's important to measure these things. We have to trust the data. It's criti critically important because if you have a sensor that's giving you erroneous data and you're making decisions off of that, we're, we're lost and we're not going to be doing the right thing. But what we can do now very accurately with the pretty amazing form factor um, is we can get very accurate sleep quantification. Um, so still non-EEG based devices have trouble doing super accurate sleep staging. So that's the caveat behind some of this. But um, to me, and I just saw some recent data on this from a Navy lab and, and we've duplicated it, some of it as well. Um, where we can get really, really great quantification of the time that you spend in bed and the efficiency of that sleep. And to me, if we can get those two things right, like the first thing within your power uh, is how much time you spend in bed. And now after reading some of the recent literature about links uh, to Alzheimer's disease from, from sleep and all-cause morbidity and some really scary things on sleep, I religiously make sure, unless I'm traveling um, and is out of my control, that I get eight hours in bed, if not more, uh, but now with technologies like this, it's also about the efficiency of your sleep that you get while you're in bed. So you can make those right choices in life uh, to get that efficiency up. Um, it's good to have balance in your life, but it's also good to make good decisions so, so you can get that. So this is one of the technologies that we rely on heavily. And the other thing nicely that this does is heart rate variability. Um, so you heard Dr. Walker talk earlier this morning about autonomic nervous system. This is a go-to for us in the high performance community, and I think it's important for everybody as well 
that is a quantified way to actually look at your recovery and your autonomic nervous system balance. So you've got, as you mentioned, your fight or flight, which is your sympathetic, your recovery mode, which is your parasympathetic. So while you're in the middle of a workout, and like right now, I'm probably fully sympathetic, um, but once I relax a little bit, I'm gonna get that back to that parasympathetic. So what's important is your heart rate variability when you sleep, what's also important, heart rate variability right when you wake up, and we can do some really nice prescriptive things. So this is one of those really great devices that can give us accurate object, uh, object, objective data to make really good decisions. So I'll give you an example of um, what we do with our football team at, at WVU. Uh, so this is one of the best staffs uh, I've ever worked with. Uh, so I walked into a really great situation where they did things the right way, they had a great culture, um, and they really use recovery as their optimum tool to, to help their athletes. Um, so what we did is we, over last season, collected over a million data points. So they, their athletes are wearing GPS sensors, sleep sensors, doing heart rate variability, um, subjective measures, all these different things. Um, but what's really cool about this is all the recovery statistics. So basically we have got an iPad at all their different recovery stations. We don't see float on there because I got it in at the very end of the season because I didn't have a place to put it. But um, they do cryotherapy, they do photobiomodulation, massage, Normatec, all these different things. So now we actually look statistically at when every single person did recovery and how that affected their sleep, their autonomic nervous system, and their performance in, during games. And so now we've got in year two, we actually use all that information to, to dial them in and get prescriptive about, about the recovery we need them to do. What we're doing on the military side um, is incredibly uh, exciting as well. And so this is a little bit different to where it's uh, obviously less structured than a football team where everybody's doing the same thing at the same time. This is a lot more focused on how can I give information back to the operator, back to the warfighter to help them make decisions they need to make. So this has to actually work pretty autonomously. But now we've got a system that we developed, a human performance platform that's rolling out um, a lot higher than the DOD where they can wear things like Aura, they can provide subjective information, we can have injury data, we can have force plate data, all this, all this data coming, coming in where normally it'd be really hard to decipher all of this. But now it all goes into a mobile app, and so the operator, the warfighter can log in and, and instantly see this is what's going on with me. Um, and we've got some pretty complex decision trees out of that can actually tell them, hey, this is what's going on with your data. Your sleep Z-score has just been in the tank the last three days. This is what we suggest that you do. Um, and then practitioners can reach out to them as well, so they can see that happening on the other side and see if I'm looking at trying to help um, 100 warfighters. You know, who's, who's got an issue and who do I need to look at and, and how can I help them? Um, so that's all, all coming, coming through right now. But this is really the so what of all of this, right? And this is what I want to spend the rest of my time talking about. Um, this is something that um, uh, Mark and I and some other special operator uh, coaches have worked on um, over the last six months. And what we're trying to do is provide this recovery roadmap. Um, so obviously float is near and dear to all of our hearts. There's a lot of really great stuff out there. Float's always my go-to. Um, I work a ton in the sports science community and um, am privileged to give talks at um, all sorts of professional sporting events and, and combines and things like that. And people always come up to me and say, because they have pretty good budgets, and they say, what should I buy? What should I buy? And I, my go-to is always buy some float tanks because I know absolutely it works. I've seen it work hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, don't you know, buy a $100,000 GPS system. Buy these first because I know this is going to fix your athletes. But now we get into places where professional teams have a lot of this stuff in there. And luckily, some of the higher special operations units are getting a lot of these things. But now we need to, to Justin's point, we need to be better about the research. We need to educate. So how can we provide these educational tools to coaches and practitioners, athletic trainers, um, anybody that needs that data to say, like, this is why we're doing these things. Um, this is how it's going to actually help you. This is the optimal dosage. This is when we actually want to do all this stuff. So. Um, what we're working on right now, um, so we got these infographics out to, to a lot of different units, uh, working on a review publication to actually show, and this is our roadmap to, to doing the research, right? There's some things we absolutely don't know. Um, Nitrogen-based cryotherapy, as discussing before, like the literature is 50-50. I, I still can't tell heads or tails of that one. That just means we need to do more research. So that helps prioritize what we need to actually look at. So I want to uh, talk about uh, two of my favorite um, so float will come next, obviously. Um, but one that I'm really, really excited about as well is photobiomodulation therapy. How many people have heard of PBM? All right, anybody tried it? Okay, cool, I love it. Um, what I think is really unique about this, um, again, just like float, like these things have been studied for decades, uh, but it's the technology and the companies that are driving these things to the next level that are making them available so we can actually get them to the people we need to get them to. 
And so I say PBAM has been studied at least 50 years. Um, the way it was first discovered was, I think, in the 60s. Um, there was a researcher who was doing a um, cancer tumor ablation study in, in a mouse model. Uh, used a laser um, to actually ablate it, so they would actually insert the tumor into the animal, so um, would have to you know, do a surgical insert, um, and ablated that tumor and got it to, to shrink, and then somebody tried to replicate that study, um, and back then you had to make lasers by hand with um, ruby crystals, and his study didn't work, but what he found was the wound actually healed faster, and it grew hair, and then when he went back and looked at the laser, it was actually tuned at the photobiomodulation wavelength, so the laser was wrong, but that's what really kicked off this PBM is wound healing. It actually has a cellular mechanism as well, which we look at here. And so what's exciting about this is this can actually do cellular repair, right? So this can repair your cells to um, enhance your mitochondrial efficiency and do really great things on a cellular level. So any light um, between 400 and 1,000 nanometers can actually activate the cytochrome C oxidase enzyme and do this cellular pathway. What's critical about photobiomodulation, why it looks like a tanning bed and it's red and near infrared light, is you've got to get those photons to the cell, right? So wavelengths between 650 and 850 can actually penetrate through and aren't as highly absorbed by the water and tissue and can actually get that penetration depth. Um, but it's also very so specific to wavelength and the number of photons that you get there as well. So there are now a number of uh, these, we call them tanning beds, um, just because that's what they look like, but you will not get tan on them. Um, you will get stronger, you will recover faster, your pain will be reduced, um, you'll get better sleep. Like all these things have been proven in the literature. Um, what's different about this is all the literature studies have been, uh, like one's very common, it's I don't know, probably 50, 60 studies. You take a cluster of LEDs, put it on your quad, you precondition with this light for 15 minutes, go through a maximal strength study, so squats or, or just leg extensions. And what happens is they do blood you know, pre, post, 10 minutes, and all sorts of hours afterwards, you're instantly stronger, your creatine kinase levels are lower, and your inflammation markers are lower. So you're getting stronger and you're actually recovering faster. Uh, but this has applications, um, chronic pain is used, it's already been studied for chronic pain, but now we're seeing this dynamic of alternative therapies to handing out drugs, um, which have obviously good benefits for everybody. So finally, float therapy. Um, so I got exposed to float therapy again from, from Mark Stevenson, and, and again, I was, I was very uh, blessed and lucky that I reached out to him. I just knew somebody who knew somebody, um, and he invited me down to the, the military group that he was working with, and he spent two days with me, um, and it was, it was pretty unbelievable, and it, it really changed, changed my life and changed the course of my research. And I went in there with an idea of like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had a bunch of wearable sensors and we could put them together and you have this red, yellow, green stoplight system so you knew what was going on with your guys? He said, yeah, I want that. Let's do that. So by the end of the second day, I felt a little bit more comfortable, but I saw these guys were going in and out of these rooms all day long. And so these are very high level guys um, who could choose to do anything that they want to do, right? They can listen to the strength coaches. They can not listen to the strength coaches. They can come in and do whatever. Um, they're, they're at that level, but they're choosing to take their time to go into these float tanks. Um, and, and that's what I found out was back there. I was like, hey, what's going on back there? He's like, oh, those are our float tanks. Like, what's a float tank? Um, so that's always my kind of ground truth with, with this group is if they're choosing to do these things and they feel better and it makes them perform better um, subjectively, however we want to measure it, there's something to it and I'm going to dig into it. So digging into all the lit literature that we've seen before and there's some pretty amazing things that are going on with it. So I instantly bought one for my lab, got them for as many athletic institutions that I could get. Like whenever I could cram one in, in some corner which it didn't belong in, I, I was putting it in there because I know it worked. But now here comes the research, right? And so lucky with our institute that uh, finally, for the first time ever, I put float tanks in a room that was designed to have a float tank. I put a shower in the right place. I had everything where I could do it the right way. Um, so that helped a ton. Uh, but now I'm able to do a lot of really, really fun studies. Um, so I want to point a couple of them out. A couple years ago, Lydia Caldwell, she's one of my PhD students, um, showed some of this data, but I want to reiterate it. So. I think the second float tank I put in was at the University of Cincinnati. Um, these guys are amazing, but basically the cost of entry for any athlete to get in a float tank is you're gonna give a pre-post heart rate variability, and sometimes they're gonna take your blood. Um, but that's the cost of admission. What we found in that, I think we're up to over 500 floats now. It's the only recovery modality I've seen that balances your autonomic nervous system no matter which direction you're, you're out of whack. So if you're highly sympathetic going in there, if it's after workout, you're under-recovered, you get an absolute dramatic reduction in your sympathetic system, um, close to getting you back into balance. Now, you, you can be overly parasympathetic, which 
Um, most people don't don't know if you're um, really not into into the research as much. So more recovery is not always better. So being parasympathetically overreach means your parasympathetic system is just not kicking on. It's trying to recover, trying to turn on the recovery cycle, but it's not doing it. So that's a bad thing as well. And we found that grad, it's a little bit more gradual. It's not as pronounced as the sympathetic, but we can actually bring you back into balance sympathetic or parasympathetically as well. So that's why it's important for us, for everybody that we work with, that we know that heart rate variability because that's when we know your body's out of whack and we need to do something about that. And, and float's the one that, that we've seen works in, in either direction. Um, the other thing that we saw is <clears throat> pre-post cortisol. So we saw an average of 30% decrease in blood-based cortisol, which is our kind of home run stress metric in just a 60 minute float. And that's with, I think uh, about 50 or 60 athletes at this point. So that's really exciting. Um, the next one we're looking at, uh, we just got funded to do a study um, from the Chuck Knoll Foundation. Um, so Chuck Knoll, the um, Hall of Fame coach from the Pittsburgh Steelers, and he, his foundation is very into um, adolescent concussions and how can we reduce them. And our thought was, yeah, we would love to do all that equipment stuff and reduce concussions, but if you get concussed, how can we help you recover from concussion? And that's our studies to look at float therapy and photobiomodulation therapy. So it's a clinical trial. Um, it just got approved. We're starting to recruit subjects, I think, hopefully next week. Uh, but really just looking at um, historically, as, you, as is now part of your standard care, so you're going to float two days a week as you're recovering from your concussion. And we'll do all the normal concussion metrics to see if I would like to show that we can accelerate recovery from concussion um, based on uh, historical data. We also want to show there's no adverse effects, but um, I already know firsthand that there's professional teams and collegiate teams that this is part of their care cycle. And I know for sure it works because I watch games on Saturdays and Sundays and I, I see guys that the commentators even say like, how's he back? Like, I think I know why he's back. Um, uh, so that's, that's an exciting study that we have going on right now. Uh, sleep optimization. So I mentioned how important sleep is to all things health and wellness. Um, so what I want to look at for more of a, obviously, obviously it helps the elite side, but just the general population. I think we are all, we can all agree we're underslept. So show of hands, who gets on average more than eight hours of sleep a night? That's terrible. This room should be better at that. No, I'm going to raise my hand, I, well, maybe seven or eight. Um, anybody average less than six a night? All right. Well, it does, doesn't count. Um, so that, that's a problem. So what I feel is with all of these stress reduction techniques, if whatever I do during the day can help enhance your sleep and help your sleep efficiency, that's a good thing to do. So we wanna, we're want to we actually going to start a study at our place where um, we're going to have subjects come in, we'll enroll those subjects, but I'm also, and we had a good talk backstage, I'm very interested in just somebody coming off the, off the street and floating for the first time, and how long does it take you to really understand and get used to floating? Um, we've had a really great experience where, with our athletes at WVU, and I'm, I'm surprised, I thought they would just be normally used to having a screen in their face and, and being really apprehensive to floating, but almost across the board, they absolutely love it. Um, but what I want to know is like with actually really good sleep tracking, can we positively affect the sleep that you get by floating? And I think we've seen all of that subjective data in the literature that says it can do that, but we want objective now that we've got things like aura rings and we've got EEG-based um, sleep measures. What I think is also critical, and I saw this in my own data, um, is we need to understand what's happening in the float tank. So in-float physiology is critical to what we do at the RNI. So we now have forehead-based EEGs, so we're using the Cerebra Health Prodigy um, to get EEG in the float. We're going to do EKG in the float with a Zephyr bio harness, um, the patch version. What hit, hit home on me is it's always, I think it's always a good thing to float, but I need to understand what's happening in that float. And so we've done some subjective things to say, like, how long do you think you were in there? Do you feel like you fell asleep? And that's our paradi paradigm with any athlete that comes in. We've got an iPad that asks these questions pre and post, and, and we've got a, a, you know, getting a lot of data that way. But my experience, the first time wearing an EEG, I'm, a, I'm an experienced floater. I thought for sure I was awake the whole time, conscious, thinking. I came up with some good what I thought were some good ideas, had the EEG on. I was asleep for all but four minutes of it based on my EEG. I was shocked. Like, I'm experienced at this, but that's important to me because I think we've all had different experiences in the float, but I want to understand that in-float physiology to see how that's going to uh, affect what we're doing. So, yeah, to our athlete performance side, we've got um, athletes from women's soccer, football, men's basketball. We've got an exciting project uh, with our rifle team. Uh, right now, so very, very cognitively focused um, team as well. Um, last couple of studies I want to mention, um, and these are all just starting. So we just opened our doors in June at our facility, so these are all now uh, just starting to roll through. I'm very interested in cognitive enhancement. So we think about everything that we know from the sleep literature. 
and learning and actually encoding what we learn. So you need to wake up with an empty hippocampus so you can ex accept more information. You need to go to sleep to encode what you just learned. So at some point during the day, our brains get full. And the, all those all-nighters I pulled in college were a waste of time. Maybe I, I probably did well on the test, but I retained absolutely nothing, right? So what if we can now actually give our brain a break during the day? So what if floating is part of what we do to give your brain a reboot during the day? So we're going to do a lot of those really nice sleep studies that have shown accelerated learning, memory retention, all those things. But what happens if you get that boost uh, during the day? And finally, we've got um, some exciting projects uh, with our chronic pain clinic. So actually making this part of the norm um, for chronic pain as well. So um, with that, I would absolutely love to chat with as many people as I can afterwards. I'm excited to connect up with all you guys. I think we can do some really exciting things. Um, I've got an idea for a really large end study that we can do with some float centers. That's my information. Uh, please hit me up on email, call me, text me, um, whatever. I'm really bad at emails. Uh, I'm trying to get better. Uh, maybe I'll do that on the plane on the way back. But thank you guys very much. Appreciate it.